following program is a presentation of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio in iTunes. And now, it's time for the show that breaks down the options market. From unusual activity alerts to market updates and trading strategies. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. Break it down. It's time to hit the option block. With your host, Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com. And co-hosts, Mike Tussaw from KnowYourOptionsInc.com and Mark Sebastian from OptionPit.com. The Option Block is brought to you by Options Express. Don't spend time worrying about your broker. At Options Express, security, stability, and account protection are the most important responsibilities to our customers. Secure account access, enhanced financial protection, entrusted with over $7 billion in customer assets, established financial stability. Options Express lets you trade with confidence. Stocks, options, and futures, all in one account. Trade with a specialist. Visit optionsexpress.com slash OX radio to open your free account. Options Express is a member of FINRA, SIPC, and NFA. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Option Block. We are your bi-weekly source for all things options related, a little bit of options education, a little bit of analysis mixed in with some strategy, some unusual activity, and dashed on top a sprinkle of entertainment. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as the Options Insider Radio Network. I want to take this moment right here at the top of the show to remind all of our listeners that if you're going to be in or around Chicago next month, actually closing in on about a month from now, May 15th, a little less than a month from now, we're going to be holding our premier live event, the Unusual Activity Forum, right there on the good old Chicago Board Options Exchange. If you like what we talk about on this show every week in the Odd Block, where Andrew and I and others pare down some unusual activity and break it down and talk about how we found it, and what we can do with it, that is something we're going to take to the extreme at this event. We've rounded up a group of experts from all across the country going to dive into all the minutia of how we really break down unusual activity at the Options Insider. We've been doing it since 2007 over here. It's kind of something we got the ball rolling with very early in the options space, and we've been doing it for a long time, so we have a, a great deal of facility in it. It's going to be a great day. We're throwing in a floor tour a bunch of great stuff, live vol and uh, market taker mentoring stuff and stuff from the option pit guys and even a copy of Mark's book. You, you name it, we're throwing the kitchen sink in. All that for 99 bucks. If you're going to be in Chicago on the 15th, and by all means, surf on over to theoptionsinsider.com slash events. You can read more there as well as register for the event yourself. If you like this show, I think you're going to like what we're talking about at our premier unusual activity forum. And don't worry, if you're not in the Chicago area, a lot of you are writing in, hey, I'm not in Chicago, I want to see this, I want to see this. Don't worry, we're looking to bring this to other areas as well, but got to get the first one under our belt first. So that's going to be in Chicago. We're better to start it off than there, and then we'll keep on rolling to other cities throughout the country. So if you want to attend this or see this sometime down the road, drop us an email. Say, hey, we'd like to see this in our town too or somewhere near us, and we'll see what we can do. All right, and with the promo out of the way, let me introduce the rest of my all-star panel today. Joining me first up, He's a man who was flooded out of last week's show, but now he is able to join us once again, beaming in from the sunny, indeed tropical environs known as St. Charles, Illinois, is none other than the man himself, good old Uncle Mike Tusa. Uncle Mike, welcome back to the show. I'm glad you can make some time for us in the run-up to the great earnings events. Always excited to be here. You know, it's funny you mentioned the flood. On Thursday morning, I scheduled an early appointment with one of my clients out east. Uh, I was supposed to be at 7 a.m. Chicago time, so I was just going to do it from my old basement office at my house. And when I, I had to postpone it because I told her, hey, your account's underwater, literally. But she didn't think it was as funny as I did. Somehow I'm not surprised that that joke didn't resonate <laughs> with her. I don't know. Call, call but she crazy. was a good sport. Once once I explained to her the full situation, she did kind of think it was funny. 
<laughs> All right. And also joining us, speaking of someone else who was quasi-flooded out, he was able to make the show last week, but couldn't make it to downtown Chicago. He is Alex Jacobson, a.k.a. the Viceroy, beaming in from the offices of Options Express. Alex, welcome back to the show, sir. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, uh, we uh, stayed dry, but we were uh, an island amongst the sea of flooding, and uh, 41 was flooded, and Deerfield Road was flooded. It it was neither a fit day for man or beast. Uh, I guess a fit day for fish and ducks, though. Yes, I suppose if you look at it as our friends from the sea and waterfowl see it, then it was a great day. But uh, for the rest of us land mammals, we weren't so fortunate. <laughs> Speaking of land mammals, we are also joined by not exactly a land mammal, but of a crustacean variety at the very least, none other than the rock lobster, good old Andrew Giovinazzi from OptionPit.com. Now, Andrew, how are things in the land of blissful sunshine and beautiful beaches and succulent, delicious lobster? You know, I have to say, all those things are happening today. You know, we, we do have sunshine, uh, beautiful beaches, uh, I checked it out this morning, uh, and uh, the lobsters still are jumping out of the water into the fishermen's uh, cages, into the lobster traps. So life is good there in good old Maine. Yep, 350 pounds still. It's, uh, it's all. Uh, it's not good for the lobstermen, but it's good for me. <laughs> <laughs> all right, and with the team assembled and ready to rock, we're going to dive right on into the trading block. The Trading Block. All right, and welcome to The Trading Block. This is, of course, the portion of the show where we break down the day's worth of action from the street and from the options market. And we're up, we're down, we're up, we're down. It's another one of those roller coaster couple of weeks. And today we're on the upside of that train. Most of the major indices closing up on the day pretty strongly with the S&P up about half a percent. To close at 1562, the Nasdaq leading the charge up nearly a full percent, 232.33, and the Dow somewhat of a laggard, only up about a tenth of a percent to 14567. And as you might expect, coming off the, a little bit of a weekend, but also a, uh, a an aggressive rally in the broad underlying, we're seeing VIX cash turn into the dark side, down nearly six tenths of a point to 14.38 kind of hovering right in the middle of that range. We said a couple weeks ago, a couple weeks back that VIXCast seemed to have found a floor around the 11 to 12 handle, and of course it gapped up immediately up to the 18 handle. Now it's hovering in the middle of that range, trading around the 14 range. So not surprising given all the moves you've had of late and the actual realized vol we've experienced in the marketplace as a whole. We're not, nothing theoretical these days. The market's actually moving for a change. And of course you also have some earnings lighting up the old tape on the screen, both earnings to come and earnings that we just saw. And we had some earnings this morning with, uh, I think, Caterpillar coming out this morning with uh, not exactly overwhelming earnings. And as we speak, everyone is prepping for the release from the old Widowmaker, a.k.a. Netflix. Not so much of a Widowmaker anymore. They've since regained a lot of their early losses. But, of course, it, you have to wonder what's what's left to, to happen here with Netflix with uh, an early rally going on with about up about seven percent or eleven dollars today seven to one seventy four thirty seven looks like the number is already out because in the after hours Netflix is up another thirty handles to trading two oh four now up to two oh six so uh, a lot of love here for the widowmaker perhaps we'll start there Andrew are you guys discussing Netflix at all today in any of your option pit live or any of your breakdowns with your clients yeah. Yeah, we did. Uh, we had we, we steered most of our clients away from selling the iron condors in there. Um, Seems like so, a savvy move right about now, anyway. It does. Well, we you know that one. I gotta see. You know, it moves. It does stuff. Uh, iron condor. I like iron condors on names that I ha are less. That I know it's always tempting for everybody to sell that high implied volatility, but it's usually high for a reason. Um, there's, I'd like better. So we actually had like a double calendar that might look okay today. Like the 200, 140, it was for about, if you could do it for about a dollar 60, I think it probably, uh, I think you might get some value out of that. What do you mean um, by a double count? You mean like a ratio? Yeah, no, by, by the 200 call spread and by the 140 put spread in the, uh, May, April. Oh, I see what you're saying. Term. Okay. And, and the, April and week watch, four. Exactly. And watch the April just disintegrate. And uh, you still have the May for another week. And that's probably going to be worth, I don't know, maybe it looks like around two bucks now. Um, so it, 
it, it was a way to play a big move was just putting little dollars out instead of like buying a straddle or something like that. You know, instead of paying 22 bucks for the straddle or $25 for the straddle, you can pay, you know, um, you know, a dollar and a half and still have a shot at, uh, you know, kind of a bigger move. So, yeah, let's let's uh, see here where Netflix went out going into, of course, it closed today at 175. That straddle, of course, with today's movement, it moved 11 handles already. Uh, the 175 <laughs> weekly straddle went out at about twenty six dollars. So, uh, yeah, the, the pre earning straddles have been knocking it dead out of the park. Buy the buy the juice for free, and it's just it's it's been just off out of category, you know, movement. So, uh, you know, it's sometimes it works, sometimes, <laughs> and when it works, it works really big. Yeah, it seems like we've been discussing buying premium going into earnings quite a bit of late, particularly straddles. We discussed it on Vol Views last week as well, and that does seem to be the the play du jour these days because you're getting essentially a lot of free decay and sometimes you get a pop that's worth it. Sometimes you can scalp your gamma here. You didn't need to, it was all one direction, but as long as you were along that straddle, along that premium, you did all right. And, uh, it was, yeah, it's certainly becoming a more, I think attractive option than it was for a lot of people just a few quarters ago where everyone was just, you know, short the world. And now all of yeah. a sudden everyone's really starting to look again. And I, I hear what you're saying, Andrew, the, the clients, the, the customers are a little bit reticent at first when they hear that. What do you want me? You want me to go into earnings long straddles? And it's a little bit of a pushback on that. But you don't even have to go to the event. You can always close it out prior to the event itself. Today, I know. And it's it's been happening a lot lately, too. Um, you know, I mean, I look at just looking at gold. The gold vol was super cheap, uh, what, three weeks ago. So I think, you know, everybody, it's one of those things we try to tell our clients. Uh, everybody thinks, well, stuff is mispriced. Aren't the high frequency guys going to bang it back into place? And, and the real answer is on, on some like micro type moves, spreads and things like that. Yeah. But on larger moves where they can't bang it back into place because they have to carry a gigantic no, yeah. position to they, move the they needle. don't have the muscle to move vol serious vol and nobody you know? and nobody wants the position exactly that anymore <laughs> that's kind of the definition of high freak you don't want to be carrying all that vega overnight or no. anything like that no, you know they, they, they can correct near-term you know call put parity stuff and things like that that get a little bit out of whack that's easy to do you can leg in and out of that pretty quick and have no residual position when you're talking long-term vol discrepancies that's uh that's a little bit outside of their bailiwick right they just they, you know wait it out and then you could you know and then you and then for them it's just you, you know you can teach positioning for what's going on and that's you know that's obviously what we do but um it was a good uh it was an interesting earnings report and what i'm surprised is is i you know what is netflix making like 12 15 cents a share per quarter or something like that so clearly it ain't. Is there really the earnings driving it, or is it the fact that somebody's going to take them out? I don't know. But it was quite a. Uh, it's quite a performance of that stock from the last earnings cycle to this one. What is it? It's up 100 percent now. <laughs> yeah, with this Whoops. with this move, it's doubled. It was trading exactly 100 <laughs> going into the pre-earnings last time, and now it's trading in the after hours over 200. So. And even Microsoft. Yeah, Microsoft, another one. You know, before we get to Microsoft, really quick, I just want to say sure. it is somewhat encouraging for me. Looking at what's going on with Netflix, and granted, I haven't I haven't dug into the numbers yet. And of course, you have Amazon coming up later this week. See what happens with them. But they're kind of an analogous story where it's almost uh, like 10 or 15 years ago from a from an online perspective. But all these a lot of these firms like Netflix are now starting to see the value of of curating their own original content. And for someone like me, who's entire business is content. That's that's an enthusiastic thing to see other people recognizing the value of that. I mean, Netflix has been doubling down. Amazon just announced a slate of shows that they're creating internally that their users can vote on. So a lot of these guys like Netflix, I mean, they, that's one of the reasons they got their legs cut out from under them a year ago or so was that all these other content creators were squeezing them because they realized Netflix had all the cards and and they were they were had given them their content for a song. So now they were starting to squeeze them and Netflix realized, wait a minute, we hold we own none of this stuff that we're showing. Maybe if we own some of this, we could actually get a little bit more out of it. So they're investing in content, which I think is actually uh, fantastic. And it looks like so far the street appears to agree with them. But though of course you're right, Andrew, there could be a lot of other fluff built into this number. Perhaps some other uh, M&A stuff going on in the background to to boost that number. And you mentioned Microsoft. Microsoft, another one feeling the love. You know, we joked about Microsoft being a resounding meh many times on this show and the last earnings certainly seemed to start off that way with the name pretty much uh hovering in that same range bound area if you were a premium seller in microsoft at least initially you did fairly well uh, but hopefully you covered right after the event because this stock has been 
uh, off to the races ever since, up about 3.5% or one over a handle today to close at $30.80. I know, Alex, you watch Microsoft a lot. You, what do you make of this move in Microsoft over the past couple of sessions? I, I think there's a, a core company and load of cash there that makes it attractive. I, I, you know, Microsoft is a company everybody loves to hate, and there's been all the press lately about how you know, PCs aren't selling, and if you dig down, they've already sold 60 million copies of Windows 8. You know, and everybody, it, it's the classic story. They, everybody says they don't make money in Windows, they make money in Office, but they sold 60 million copies of 8, and here at Schwab Options Express, we're going to flip to 8. So uh, Delay that as long as possible if you have my recommendation. <laughs> I, I just switched over about a month ago, and can I just say... Uh, not an enthusiastic fan in any way, shape, or form. It really, well, it really obscures to... everything that you want to do. Yeah, we're not going to touchscreen. We're just going to the core. We're not changing it over the hardware. But, uh, you know, Microsoft is it, it's just a company everybody likes to pan. And nonetheless, everybody uses it. And, uh, you know, I think the market is rewarding them. I, I also think, by the way, that markets are still thin. And these moves are going to be a bit over-exaggerated. Uh, I know on the desk here today, it was Lulu, Netflix, Microsoft, and that strange fruit company was back lighting up the the phones today. And, uh, you know, everything had a great day. Lulu, a name that's, you know, been living dead for a few weeks, uh, you know, had the problem with see-through uh, – Yoga pants, uh, not in my size, obviously, but, uh, you know, off their bottom, they're uh, up 13 or 14 points off that, that recent low. Um, so, yeah, it was a good day. It was an interesting day. A lot of stuff moved today. Uh, you know, the point that both you and Andrew made, a lot of the stuff is perfectly suited for the, you know, options market. If you're going to do a risk-managed trade, I mean, you have a move here after hours of uh, going on almost 40 points in Netflix. Why would I ever trade the cash if I can trade it uh, via the options market? I, I, I lurked on a call today that our trading desk uh, took, and it was a customer who had bought some Netflix calls. And I, I don't remember the strike or the expiration, but, you know, they, they, they bought them for – a tad around two dollars, and they were trading nine intraday. And if we uh, open off the aftermarket, those things are going to be forty bucks tomorrow morning. You know what a great score for somebody putting two bucks, you know, at risk. So, option market was fun today. There you go. That guy maybe he'll uh, he'll subsidize some of your cleanup out there in the. <laughs> In the flood ravaged lands where you live, Alex, uh, with all those uh, options profits he's banking from Netflix. And you know, Uncle Mike, you talk a lot here about watching Google and some of these other tech names. You don't talk a lot about Microsoft. We talk about Microsoft a lot here on the show, though. I'm, I'm curious what you make of this. I don't know if you want to call it new and improved or just newly revamped or just uh, on an uptrend here, Microsoft. What you think of this name? Any of your clients kind of interested in it? And are you starting to take a look here at Microsoft and perhaps legging into some puts or put spreads or verticals or risk reversals or what you think out there? Well, I've had a small position in Microsoft for a while now. Um, took some heat on it, but still uh, what we're doing, it's just a covered call position. And uh, what we we're planning on doing was waiting till the earnings were over before we sold some premium again. And um, <laughs> glad we did. Uh, but it's still just long the stock at this point, and probably in the next few days I'll be looking to sell something in maybe like the 31, 30, or probably the 32, 33 level, just seeing where that where it goes from there. What happened today that I thought was interesting, what seemed to have been moving it the most from all the news that I could tell, is that some hedge fund just announced that they had some $2 billion stake in Microsoft, and that's what drove it up three and a half percent today. Uh, it seems to be getting popular again, and. You know, maybe that's a sign to get out. Who knows? But um, I think like what we were saying is to add to your points to what uh, Alex was saying. It's a stock that you're right. A lot of people do love to hate it, uh, but they make money. And the stock itself has been sideways for ever, it seems. And they make money. It's kind of funny how uh, the landscape has changed. It would have been laughable 
a decade ago, the news of anyone holding a position in such a behemoth as Microsoft would have moved the stock, you know? <laughs> it was trading $400. It was the lion of the street. It was the leading tech name. Uh, even a large fund picking it up probably wouldn't have bumped the stock too much. And now, uh, these days, that could give the stock a 3.5% a boost, <laughs> if that's what actually was driving it today. Interesting stuff. But yeah, it's an interesting name, and perhaps we've written it off too soon here in the land of resounding meh. Maybe we need to revisit Microsoft, and perhaps it's getting a little bit, little bit more life. I mean, it's for so long it's been hard to say anything about Microsoft, except you know you blast out some premium around earnings, you you take it off the table after earnings, and you do all right, and then you don't touch it at all in the in the intermediate unless you want to write some more premium and you watch it slowly come your way because there wasn't much else really going on out there. But now if Microsoft's getting some life, it might be kind of interesting again. Yeah, well, one thing too, I mean, it's they made more money this year in the last you know, uh, four quarters, they did the four quarters before that. And the stock's at the same price. Actually, it's maybe even lower. <laughs> so it, at least before today, I mean, it was just trading in the 29 handle lot. So one thing when you trade options, you always want something, if you could take a piece that is relatively predictable, and then you tailor a trade on what you think is a predictable piece. And right now, the predictable piece for Microsoft is, you know, it's just it's it's staying, you know, like the 27, 28 hang, handles the low side, you know, and you can live with the stock there. So you can definitely trade that, you know, that's a that's a tradable thing. So that's that's my that is my take on Microsoft. But uh, I think it's got a ways more to go. That's you know, just me. With a Full like, disclosure, I own I own a bunch of it. <laughs> you own all of it. Your last name was is Gates, is it not? Until you changed it. I, I wanted uh, I wanted it to be <laughs> Giovanazzi, the well-known Italian derivation of Gates. It, exactly, <laughs> same same first letter, but unfortunately, uh, that's where the similarities end with that very very smart guy that that invented that company. <laughs> All right, I think with that. We're going to keep on rolling. It's time for myself and the rest of the crew here, and of course you at home if you want to play along and put on the old fedora, because it's time once again for the Odd Block. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by TheOptionsInsider.com. It's time for The Odd Block. All right, and welcome to the Odd Block. This is, of course, where we break down the interesting and or unusual options activity that lit up the old street today. And typically, we might start things off here in the Odd Block with a little $2 biotech name or some other crazy name you've never heard of, some foreign name, some foreign depository receipt. And today, we're going to do an equally obscure name that few of you have heard of, General Motors, and ticker symbol GM. Uh, they closed today $29 and a quarter, up about a dime, essentially unched on the day and they didn't they did some volume they weren't lighting up the tape but they did about uh they're averaging about 36 37 thousand contracts of late doing about 45 thousand today and we saw a little bit of reversal of the trend in, in the odd block last week where the previous weeks we'd seen a lot of call buying a lot of call buying in last week's shows we saw a lot of the opposite of that put buying a lot of people rolling to the downside and setting up to the downside this week perhaps we're heading back to the upside again with the Tale of the tape coming out of GM. Once again, some call love, particularly out here in the June 30s where we saw some size. Lighten up the old tape. Take us away, Senior Giovanazzi. I'm sorry, I mean Gates. Senior. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, it'd be fun maybe for a day. I don't know. Well, maybe not. I don't know. I'm actually, yeah, I don't know I, if you want to be I've, Bill I've Gates. I've nothing to complain about <laughs> my life. So. His money know. might be nice. I don't know if you want to be the man himself. He has a few, yeah, shall we say, quirks. Yeah. I'll just I'll stay with what I got for now. <laughs> One of the interesting things about this, so I was looking at the tape early this morning, is actually this customer was buying calls early. Uh, this is when GM was down about a quarter of a dollar, uh, and they bought uh, 7,800 June 30 GM calls for 91 cents. And like I said, you know, that it's that good old fashioned uh, kind of buying paper we saw a couple weeks ago. Uh, when everybody was still a little bit giddy about the market, I think, uh, you know, and for good reason, people got derailed last week pretty severely from all the, you know, the bad stuff that was happening. 
you know, and I, I ultimately believe the stock market is about 90%, you know, uh, mental and the other 10% is actually, you know, what physically goes on. But uh, this just a uh, buyer calls and it looked like they kept buying them, I think, pretty much all day long as I look at um, the interest. Now, the interesting thing here is the volatility actually was diving a little bit. You know, 27,000 of these calls trade on the day and the vol actually came in. Really, really weird. Now, in the morning, they were taking the offer. So I'm not quite sure what's going on with the volume. Uh, but everything that traded was looking like on the offer. Offer, offer, offer. Because the GM traded 20, close with 29.25, and the calls are basically unchanged. So either nobody's expecting a move, or like we've seen in the earnings going, you know, just recently, uh, we could, I, I don't know, it's just almost like there's almost are too cheap to words for words here, and it could be, uh, you know, another upside surprise in a stock like Yeah, it this. is kind of odd. I'm looking here at these calls going back a couple of days. They were trading the exact same price level, 29 and a quarter, just a couple of days ago with the underlying, of course. Uh, they, the calls were trading about a 30 vol. Fast forward to today, stock closes the exact same price level, 29 and a quarter. The vol comes in aggressively, trading 26 vol at the end of the day. Uh, yeah. so with these size calls, 27,000, you're right, lighting up the tape. So, uh, yeah, that that merits some further scrutiny as to what exactly was going on behind the scenes there. And I've said it before on the show, sometimes I, I tend to disparage those little explanatory notes that come with these trades, you know, spread, uh, buy right, what have you. <laughs> right, <laughs> A lot of time right. those things are, are kind of nonsense or sometimes, who knows, even intentionally uh, misleading. Put on, put on my tinfoil hat for a moment. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, this one certainly seems to be a little interesting. We'll have to dig into it after the show and see if we could really uh, come to a conclusion. We could probably spend the rest of the show speculating. But, unfortunately, we do have to move on. We'll let our listeners play a little bit of the home game as well and uh, see if they can determine on their own. Hey, that's a good game. Right in. What do you think is up with these June 30s out here in GM? Buying, selling, loving, hating. Let us know what you think while we keep on rolling in the old odd block. On to the next one, another common household name and i check this one every day when i wake up in the morning it's one of my first things on my ticker it's of course Medivation inc ticker symbol M <laughs> mdvn i don't i can't even have my coffee in the morning until i know where mdvn is, is until trading. you medivate yes exactly <laughs> <laughs> they closed today uh down about two percent to about the 54 handle and this is another one where you know we talk about themes Sometimes we do this intentionally. Sometimes it just works out this way. And I think today is one of the latter days uh, where we get some more calls active on the upside here in MDV. And, of course, a little bit different story. It wasn't just a net outright buy. It actually was a bit of a roll, rolling up and out, rolling from May 50s out to the June 55s. And this is the name overall. Doesn't exactly light up the tape, doing south of 2,000 contracts a day, but today doing about 7,000. Like I said, the bulk of that in this pretty sizable roll. Uh, so tell us what caught your eye about this roll here today, Andrew. Uh, I think it's because the, the client, from what I can see, looks like he made really good money on these May 50s. Medivation made a kind of a power move from like 44 to 54. So... You know, and because they gave up a ton on the spread. I mean, the spreads were a half a dollar wide, and they hit the bid in May, and they bought the offer in June, which was, you know, literally giving up a buck to get out of this trade. Yeah, that's a guy who doesn't care. He's got some money in his back pocket. <laughs> I, exactly. I think or or a fool, one or the other. Yeah, exactly. So I think he is uh, rolling this up. Uh, basically, he's rolling the whole enchilada up. Uh, with just the money he made. So I think he's playing with house money now, and he jacked up the number of contracts they bought in the June double side. Because uh, just looking at the open interest, there was way more open interest uh, in June, and it looks like the May was just close. And, you know, obviously it could be a very uh, interesting trade. It didn't look like any kind of a backspread because you don't really, unless you're kind of goofy, you don't backspread uh, option prices when they're that big and that where those prices are that close because it's hard to actually make the trade work if you're backspreading the ratio unless the stock takes off to, you know, like 65 bucks or something. But, you know, again, an interesting trade and look like, you know, just making some money trading options. So Yeah, two signs that the guy's doing all right on this trade. A, he, he pretty much paid the outer limits for the spread, uh, which shows he's not exactly too concerned about the money. And then B, uh, he's doubling down on his stuff. So either he's 
he got hurt before when he's swinging for the fence. It doesn't seem too likely here. It really seems like the opposite. This is a guy who said, hey, it worked really well on the May 50s. It's going to work twice as good on the June doubles. i got to get twice as many of these guys, or at least a little bit more here. Uh, so he's, he's adding a little bit more to his stake on the June 55. So uh, classic behavior of someone who's had some calls going his way and wants to extend the party for as long as he can and perhaps make it as large as he can. As well. Yeah, funky biotech too. So definitely, you know, that's definitely somebody with some either they're comfortable with where the technology is or they just know the stock's going up because it's, it's not a small trade. Yeah, according to our write-up here on the site, this is a biopharmaceutical company focused on the rapid development of small molecule drugs to treat serious diseases for which there are limited treatment options. Sounds like this is written sounds by Sounds like a great business yeah, for me. I, mean, like I want to do that. Sounds like it was written by their PR guy. Um, <laughs> but yeah, interesting stuff. I, I, I should mention at the top of the show, I always do, but sometimes I forget that. If you want to play the home game, you can, of course, read all these alerts and much more in much more detail on the options insider.com while Andrew and I are breaking this stuff down. And speaking of breaking down we're going to keep on rolling keep the party going with another big name this one actually uh, i'm not too much joking really <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not this is less of a joke than the others this was a big name back in the day kind of fell off the radar getting back up there again good old micron technology ticker symbol mu closed today at a whopping nine dollars and 31 cents this is another one you look back like a decade to the dot-com boom and this thing was just uh, uh on fire bucks. yeah and bucks. now uh now it just uh I remember cover stories on Fortune about how some uh, some of these oil barons down south were just taking all their money and putting it into Micron because it's a southern company, I believe, and just uh, just all how many how many fortunes were going to be made on that. And fast forward a decade or so, and uh, not so much. Well, yeah. <laughs> but uh, this one, yeah, despite the low uh, despite the low price, doing actually some volume out there in Micron, doing about uh, averaging about 41,000 contracts a day, doing about 45,000, so right about on pace today. And yet, once again, moral of the story, theme of the week, or at least theme of the show today, uh, calls trading, upside. This is, these are a little bit farther out, though. We're not just talking uh, one week, uh, April or slash Mays. These are Jan 2014-10, reaching high, reaching to the 10 strike there, Andrew. Yeah, again, another strange pricing on this, because they said, okay, we quote-unquote marked buy right. And I didn't believe it because it was it traded it's, it's on the It's all line. lies, Andrew. I hate to disabuse you, but it's all lies, sir. <laughs> I know. I, I know. What's annoying is it wasn't trading, you know, my pit where I could say, you know, okay, this is annoying. So you have to dissect and you got to put your hat on and go, okay, what were they really trying to do here? And, you know, ultimately, you know, the vol came in a little bit. The calls traded on the offer. So really strange volume to me. Um, although I think actually it makes a pretty decent – buy right from a risk return point of view. You know, you buy MU, you sell those calls a year later. Even if MU doesn't do anything, you got about, you got over 10% on your money, more like, uh, almost like 15% or something, uh, like 13% or something like that. So if you go by the buy right yield idea, it's a, it's an interesting trade. Uh, but again, I could not, I'd had a hard time believing it was a buy right because they got the calls off almost through the offer. So and I didn't see any the stock printing, so it was hard to, 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 to delineate that. But it was by far the biggest trade in MU. I mean, nothing was nothing was even close. So, um, and there was considerable open interest on this strike too. So, yeah, there are some I players out here in long term, yeah. quali- somewhat long term Micron. Uh, you got forty seven thousand open on the Jan twelves. You got fifty three thousand open on the Jan seven puts. So, uh, yeah. there's, there's some paper out here in the longer term particularly Jan Micron here, and this guy could be could be adjusting, could be closing out some of his position. It doesn't look like he's rolling. I don't see him doing anything else here. And I don't, you're right, I don't see the stock leg going up, which would be the, the telltale sign of a buy, right? Which yeah. Is, which is I, why so, I call all those labels lies. But <laughs> Yes, all lies, lies. Uh, so, again, an interesting trade. Um, I, I, it, feels like, it feels like overall kind of bullish, either buy righty or somebody's just buying up the calls, you know, which is – you know, I don't know when the last time. I don't think Micron has made any money in the last two years. So um, it's weird. Like Apple can make money, but I guess people that just sell and stuff, nobody can make money because Apple, they just hold them over the barrel and price for everything. But yeah, I mean, if you wanted to play upside in Micron, like a, about six months ago or so, was the time to do it. Back in May, it was trading five dollars. Uh, yeah. So you had a decent run since then. If you were playing upside, and who knows, maybe this guy has been rolling ever since. I doubt he's putting on the. Uh, 
the tens and twelves back when it was trading five dollars. Maybe he was. Maybe he had that level of foresight. Uh, but uh, who knows? Interesting stuff. There are twenty thousand open in the sevens. Maybe that's him too. Maybe he's just the same guys who loved it back ten, fifteen years ago. Just doubling down in the long term calls now, Andrew. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, interesting stuff. I, I, if you want to read more about any of this stuff, like I said, visit theoptionsinsider.com. We have a lot more, but we have to, of course, keep on rolling with the show. So we're going to cut it off there. Andrew and I will surrender our fedoras until next we meet. And instead, we shall keep on rolling and let Alex put on his fancy hat because it's time for the Express Block. The Express Block, brought to you by Options Express. Options Express lets you trade where and when you want for every level of trading, from advanced charting, free daily trading ideas, and free educational resources. Options Express is the online broker for all traders. Best of all, Options Express allows you to trade stocks, options, and futures all in a single account on powerful yet easy to use trading platforms, including mobile devices. Visit optionsexpress.com/oxradio for your free account. Options Express Express is a member of FINRA, SIPC, and NFA. All right, and welcome to the Express Block. This is, of course, where Alex takes the reins and I take a bit of a rest. And Mr. Viceroy, what indeed caught your eye out there in the land of OX and perhaps the Idea Hub, sir? So put your feet up, Mark. Uh, I'm going to do my boring macro <laughs> story again. I'll go take but... a beverage. I'll be back in a few. Yeah, have have one for me too. So I, obviously, as I said earlier, Lulu and Netflix were uh, a, a lot of the tone today. But the interesting thing about what's going on in the market and and the micron trades you talked about are kind of indicative of this. We're starting to see volume again in big cap names. So I mean, if you look at some of the the, the volumes and stuff like Procter & Gamble, General Electric, Occidental Petroleum, Oracle, uh, Intel, uh, where we're past earnings, uh, obviously Microsoft, where there's been a little bit going on. But just some of the household names seem to be getting uh, a, uh, a curious amount of trading again. And traditionally... That has meant in the past when we've seen that, that's been capital coming out of Asia. And I think that's back to the macro story about people coming to our markets and buying the core names, selling calls against the core names. As Andrew pointed out, you know, you do a buy right with a 13% annualized. You got to be patient. It's a long time. It's not for the day trader, but traditionally the patient money comes from Asia. And uh, there are no yields out there. Uh, they're paying their bills, unlike the Europeans, so there is a lot of money floating around. But the stuff that's getting a bid is basic American macro names. And we're seeing uh, a fair amount of volume in, I hate to use the term boring, but we're seeing a fair amount of volume in uh, names that haven't traded a fair amount of volume in quite a long time. Now, on the other end of it, uh, let's talk Apple and Amazon. Uh, both have earnings this week. Both are trading in the 40 vol. Um, uh, you can sell a $10, door, a $10 condor uh, in Apple and Amazon for almost four bucks. I know that's going to light up screens. Just be aware of the fact that it's earnings week and markets are thin and, and these things can move. And if you're going to be a premium seller, please understand the risk. Please understand the risk. If you're going to be a premium buyer. Obviously, premium is expensive. You can play via the weeklies, but uh, the weeklies just make it a little quote unquote cheaper than the longer dated stuff, but not cheap, not on an absolute basis. Uh, they're not cheap. As I say, when $10 iron condors are, are, are trading for four, you know, buyers have to look at that and say they're expensive and sellers have to look at that and, and say they're expensive. And here's the answer. They're expensive. They're pumped. We're seeing vol. We haven't seen in a long time again, even in the SPX. Uh, back up in the 14 area, there there's some premium selling opportunities. But 
Think about what the market's done the last couple of weeks. Last week was kind of the worst week we've had in a long time. Today, Today's recovery was nice and vol came in a little bit. But there's a lot of cool stuff trading out there. But let me put the red flag up, you know. Look at Netflix today, up 11 during the day, up another two dozen in the after hours. We all know after hours is a uh, sketchy time to trade and there isn't that kind of liquidity and stuff can move 20 bucks after hours and you come in the next morning and, and it's down 30 cents and your 20 bucks is gone. But there's a lot going on this week, and there's a lot going on in the, as I say, in the macro names. And I'll I'll wear the boring hat for talking about the GEs and the P and Gs. Um, but you know, back to Andrew's comment, you can go out a year and sell leaps and get you know 12, 13 percent static rates of return in an environment where you know one year paper uh, still doesn't pay the rounding error. So I think there's a lot of macro stuff going on in the market, and I think that's going to continue to give us a lift, uh, especially in the liquid, in the stuff where you can trade more size. All right, Macro Man, a.k.a. the Viceroy, a.k.a. Alex Jacobson, man of many names and hats. Thank you for the the weekly macro block. (laughs) Now we're going to keep on rolling right on into the strategy block. The strategy block. All right, that fancy, indeed proper tune means that it is time once again for Uncle Mike to put on his smoking jacket, to pick up his brandy snifter and settle in by the fire. Of course, a little bit warm for a fire today, Uncle Mike, but hey, to each their own and dispense some options, wit and wisdom. And now, Uncle Mike, this is the part of the show usually where I would check in with my birdies and see what you have cooking for our listeners. But I'm going to go on a limb today. I'm not even going to check in with them. I'm just going to throw them their bird seed and leave them as they may be because I think I can guess what you're going to talk about with all this stuff that's been going on of late in the metals and metals land. I know you've been active a little bit on the downside out there in GLD. I'm going to guess, and stop me if I'm wrong, but I'm going to guess you're going to talk about puts in GLD and perhaps when or when not to roll a put. You know, it's ironic. You, I I don't know. I, 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 I want to fight for your birdies, but uh, good gosh, Mark, you're right. I don't know. Maybe I'm growing past them. I don't need them anymore. I don't know. Oh, don't you got to keep They might be out of work. <laughs> Oh, come on now. Well, they can come work over for me at RCM. We'll find a spot for them. So, uh, but anyway, I want to go over being, I've, I've talked about kind of my trademark tagline. I've always said about um, the market, the stock markets and metals in general, long-term bullish, short-term cautious. I have a long-term bullish stance on the U.S. stock market. And I also have a long-term bullish stance on gold and silver. And last couple, last weekend, that got tested. And I want to explain to you some things that I did uh, in the spirit of Andrew's classic line, do stuff. I want to tell you what I did. Uh, going into, not this past weekend, but the weekend before, we were long GLD and we were also long 150 puts. And with that, GLD was at about 145 going into the close. And my thought was, you know what, normally it's not down enough to where I want to roll it, but yet there's really nothing there for me to do a repair straight. There really wasn't anything there. So I'm not, if, had I done something the Friday before that weekend, it would have been just trading for the sake of trading. And the reason I didn't do something was because of the fact that there was nothing to do. So I didn't do anything. Now come in Monday, glad I didn't do anything because GLD went down quite a bit on news that China uh, had not gotten as much growth as what they were expecting. So I guess they didn't do a good enough job of manipulating their currency like they usually do. Who knows? My point is this. GLD was down around in the low 130s. And so at that point in time, we dodged all my clients that were in GLD. We dodged a major bullet to the downside with gold. And so at that point in time, the question then comes, comes up, well, do you just stay in it because gold going to come down further or do you roll down the put? Well, let's examine this for a second. 
Over the weekend, I was in a complicated cash position when you think about it. Uh, whenever you have a deep in the money put combined with long stock, it's really not much of a position at all. I mean, obviously, if GLD went to 600 or something like that, then uh, I would be like having a long stock position. But for the time being, for most minor mo movements, if you're combining a long put option with long stock, you're in gl a glorified cash position for any minor movements. So with that involved, I had, why did I, I, I decided to roll down the put, and I knew I was going to do this for the most part, but I decided to roll down the put. Uh, we rolled down to the 122 level, from 150 down to 122. And so the question is, well, why did you do uh, that roll for one? And then number two, why did you roll down the put to begin with? Well, here's the main reason as to why I rolled down the put to begin with. I'm sticking with my trading rules. I am long-term bullish. And if I'm deep in the money by over 10%, like I was on Monday because of the gap down, then I am not being part of my, I'm not being true to the long-term sentiment that I have of being long-term bullish. Now, with that in mind, in the short term, I'm very cautious on gold. Uh, we've had volatility increasing. We've had a lot of things happening in the gold world. So I still have to be cautious. Now, some could say, well, you know, why don't you just, forget protection now and just ride it on up. It's going to go up. It's come down. If you think it's going to go up, why not just go up? Well, the reason for that, I'm short-term cautious. Now, the things that we're going to be looking to do over the course of the next couple of days is look to sell look to sell some calls on GLD at the very at various strike prices. Uh, we've been kind of enjoying just being along the underlying for now and uh, having it come up a little bit uh, over the course of the last week or so. But my point is this, folks. Um, if you're doing a protective put or a collar in one way, shape, or form, you got to stay true to your principles from the get-go. And my principles are being long-term bullish, however, still being short-term cautious. And that was the whole purpose of rolling down that put. Now we have upside. I'll tell you a story. This is about a client that he's brand new to options. And so he came on board in Oh, a few months back. And so we got him into a, a, a collar on GLD and he's actually separate from the group. He came in a little bit later and we got into GLD at 169. And then we did a basically a traditional costless collar for about six months out. Uh, he really didn't feel comfortable with doing a lot of rolling and getting in and getting out. So we did the right thing for him. We put him into something a little bit more conservative in terms of frequent movement within the metal and so it was at 155 and 184 i believe is where the collar was and it was no cost and it was out to the month of june so with that he got we actually rolled his put down from the 155 level down to the 122 level and this is after talking with him and having a conversation with him and so right now he actually has the opportunity if gld runs back up to around the 150 level uh, he has the ability to be down in the underlying with which we chose, but yet still be profitable in that same period of time. Folks, that's the magic of options and how you can work them. So what did we do? We did stuff. And that's one to grow on for today. I think you should have the foreword in Andrew's forthcoming book, How to Buy Free Juice and Do Stuff. And then the two of you can, uh, can collaborate on all the riches that are sure to follow. Well, we did stuff. <laughs> well, you can use them if you have a plan. That's the key thing. That's the, always the magic of the strategy block. He's ex just executing the plan and just don't deviate from the plan. And if you if you got a hedge, you gotta you gotta sell your hedge and roll it because if you don't, it's not gonna it's not a hedge anymore. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's and speaking of rolling, we have to keep on rolling into our final segment, around the block. Around the block. All right, and welcome to Around the Block. This is, of course, where we tell you what's on our radar for the rest of this week. And still a lot of earnings on the horizon. Perhaps we'll get to those in a minute. But before we do that, uh, Senior Andrew, what is on your radar for the rest of this week, sir? Uh, well, we're, we're getting closer to uh, Facebook earnings, of course, Zynga earnings. Now that they have live I was going to get to that. I was going to ask you if you're, if you're loading up on the risk reversals again out in Zynga. 
Uh, I have some just kind of like long term at the money calls right now at this level. So just seeing, you know, like Alex would say, just go buy the stock, but it's really hard for me to buy the stock. I keep trying to make them put it to me and it hasn't happened yet. So I have the same and, problem with Ford. They won't put it to me. I keep asking yeah, them to. Yeah, you keep asking it to them. And it's like, ah, whatever. So I think I do want some upside. Um, uh, you know, waiting for the T treasuries to drop, which I don't think will ever drop. I think if Greenspan has succeeded, not Greenspan, Bernanke has succeeded. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's kind of the stuff. And obviously Apple, if we can, if, uh, you know, we might have that kind of need pre earnings trade again. So, uh, you know, there has been some movement in it the last couple of days. That's about it. You know, Vol, I just seems kind of fair to almost a little cheap now in the indexes. So there's not a lot real exciting in there for me right now. Not a lot of juice out there to be gotten for free or pretty much any other way right now, at least until yes. things, things shake up a little bit. Well, thank you for that, Andrew. And, of course, there are a lot of earnings on the docket this week. Andrew mentioned Apple. Of course, there's Ford as well. And I know one person in particular who has a lot of skin in both of those games, and probably the BBI has been quite low of late as he is planning and strategizing for what to do with this upcoming slate of earnings. So, Uncle Mike, I know all the listeners want to know they've been champing at the bit all show long. What do you have up your sleeve for Apple and Ford earnings later this week? Well, I thought Apple earnings were this morning, weren't they? Oh, darn it. My birdies have failed me again. That's it. They're done. <laughs> um, now, what I'm doing with Apple right now, we don't really have a large position in it anymore, and we've been doing like a calendar we started off with a combination uh, 450 500 bull call spread on it for May, and we we're financing it with some weekly bull put spreads. And with Apple going down as it has, the call spread has kind of I've, – I've gotten away from the bull put spreads, and the call spread has kind of turned into a calendar spread. So uh, for earnings coming up, I'm just going to leave the – long call option open for the time being because we've sold some premium out to where we're not down that much on it uh, but i'm going to leave the long call open for earnings and then after earnings we'll proceed back into a call spread of some sort and if uh, apple gets royally smoked at earnings or something like that it's a small enough position to where um, i feel comfortable with just being long premium going into earnings uh, with ford i'm just staying out of it for now i'd like it to come down a little bit more and i'd like to start selling some puts against it but um i need it to come down more for me so you're not interested in blasting out anything on the 13 handle you're more of an 11 12 guy i'm a, an 11 12 kind of guy preferably an 11 kind of guy but I'd consider 12 if we're close enough to it because I do. It, it's very handy the way with which the premium trades in Ford. I really like how it trades. Oh, it's been it's fantastic, not... and it's been so range bound for so long. It's one of the ways I ended up inheriting this short stock position. And I was just, we were just trading in and out, range bound, range bound for months, and I ended up overweighting to the upside on a collar that I had with some underlying. So we blew through that, ended up flipping and becoming short, which hasn't been a bad problem. I'm able to trend, trade in and out of it mostly, uh, but I joke about not being able to put the stock back, and I can't. I keep selling puts; they they refuse to take it back from me. So oh, uh, it, it's not it, a bad it, problem it, to have. No, it's not. It's a Goldilocks stock. It's not too big, not too small. It's just right. Exactly. So nothing, <laughs> no, nothing along the lines of the old uh, sleepless nights prior to Apple earnings, any of that kind of stuff. No, not at all. Not at all. So I just had just um, not nothing at all like that. So we'll probably be getting back into it after this earnings report. We'll see what happens. But uh, for now, just still still have a smaller position on it. The clients still uh, still as enthused now that it's hovering around the 400 handle and south of it, or are they kind of lost some? Has it lost some of its luster for them? Well, I, I took some heat when selling it at 620, but magically haven't really got <laughs> those calls have stopped coming in. I'd imagine. Yeah, so we're do. I'm I'm looking to get. I like it at these levels a lot, and it just I, I'm not a fan. I, I hate being in pos I hate earnings announcements. They should just ban earnings if you ask me because it just screws up all my strategies. <laughs> Thankfully, you're in the minority on that one, Uncle Mike. <laughs> no earnings, we would have no show. <laughs> we would just be sitting here talking about doldrums and premium erosion all day long. <laughs> What's wrong with that? Yes, that's true. From your perspective, that would be a blissful day, I'm sure. I love it. <laughs> all right. And last but certainly not least, Mr. Alex, what is catching your eye? What's on your radar for the rest of this week, sir? Going to sound like a broken record. Apple, Amazon, uh, the week four options. Um, big vol. If you're going to buy them, understand the dynamics. 
And if you're going to sell something, please sell the spread. Please just don't sell naked premium in this stuff uh, this week. Um, you know, weekly options, uh, uh, huge theta, huge gamma. So just please be aware of that. Um, if you're going to do something, understand the risks, be risk managed. Uh, and I've been asked to actually put a plug in today for three milestones. SIBO uh, is 40 next week, actually Saturday. Schwab is 40, ironically. So uh, we had a a small celebration today. I would encourage anyone who wants to trade the SIBO being 40 or Schwa being 40 to buy the cake frosting makers because there will be lots of <laughs> cakes bouncing around. Uh, another milestone the futures desk asked me to point out is the Nikki took out a five-year high today. So as somebody who grew up with a 20,000 Nikkei, uh, seeing it back up over 13 is... Uh, kind of interesting and uh, that's kind of back to what's going on from a macro basis out there in the in the world of futures and options indeed i was going to say that belongs in the old macro block where we talk about the the asian influx on a somewhat regular basis here but thank you for that sir and <clears throat> and that is going to do it for the around the block segment and unfortunately that's all the time we have for this episode of the option block as well but as usual, really quick before we go, I like to check in with all of my cohorts here, my partners in crime, to see what they have cooking in their respective necks of the woods. And we'll start with you, Mr. Rock Lobster. What is cooking out in the land of the pit? Uh, look for us at the Street Monster Investment Conference in New York with uh, the Nigerians, Jim Cramer, and Mark Sebastian on June 7th uh, in New York. It's a big to-do. And uh, again, you learn a lot about trading, using options, and all the rest of it. So I highly recommend uh, all of you to get going. And, <laughs> and uh, again, just a, a nice, a real nice event there. <laughs> sure. Say they who shall not be named on my network and OX's show. Why not? <laughs> I'm sure that'll go over well. All right, I forgot sir. about that rule. <laughs> All right, sir. <laughs> Thank you for that, Andrew. And next up, Mr. Tusaw, enlighten us. What is coming on ye old RCM webinar train? Uh, at RCM, we're taking a break from the webinar train this week, but next week we do have another guest scheduled, so we'll be more information on that as we grow closer. So stay tuned to rcmaccess.com. All right, and last but not least, Alex, what is coming up in the land of OX, sir, aside from all this cake eating and celebrating? Uh, cake is good. When you're my size, cake is a priority. So uh, tomorrow, the 23rd at 1 p.m., Russell Rhodes from the Seabell will be doing a webinar on index weeklies. Uh, very, very sharp guy, Russell, a CFA, really knows his stuff does really fascinating webinars. Uh, the 24th, Wednesday, we're going to revisit minis at 2 p.m. Chicago time and talk about what's going on in minis. And as we've talked about before, they're kind of okay. I got a trade-off in some apples today and uh, took a while, but I got filled at the midpoint. And then at 3.30 on Wednesday, uh, we're going to show the hub again. We did it last week. Uh, we're going to do it again this week. Of course, by the time we do it on Wednesday, the uh, the Apple earnings will have occurred. So that will take out a number of the ideas. Uh, but we're going to show the industry's first uh, iron condor finder attached to a brokerage house. So we're excited about that. And then there'll be cake. So who could ask for anything more? Who could indeed? Thank you for that, Alex. And of course, all of us here on the Option Block All Star Panel want to thank all of you out there in the listening audience for downloading and streaming and subscribing to this program and making it such a success. And don't worry if you've been sending in your questions and your comments, we'll get to them on an upcoming show. We've just been too busy, love late, to crack open the old mailbag, but we'll get to it once again. And on behalf of all of us here on the Option Block All Star Panel, thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time right here on the Option Block. Become a part of the Option Block 
Just visit www.theoptionsinsider.com slash forum to post a question for the hosts. You can also submit questions to twitter.com slash option block or leave a voicemail at 312-544-9356. Make it interesting and your question just might make it on the air. The Options Block is property of the Options Insider Incorporated, all rights reserved. of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com radio or search for Options Insider Radio in iTunes.